What's up guys, Sean the Bro here, and today we're going to be going over another episode of our third person tutorial series and action RPG tutorial series. And this time we're going to be going over lock on and targeting. So what this means is we will be able to press a button and then we'll be able to walk around, I'm not moving the camera, focused upon a certain object. Now this could be more than an enemy, it might be an objective, it might be a vehicle, it might be something like that. For right now, we're going to be testing it on our base enemy BP because we already have that in the game. And then I can disengage it, lock on to another actor, and do the same thing. So being able to target and lock on enemies is really useful, especially when trying to fight one-on-one. -on -one. So say I pick up a weapon, such as my sword, you know, as always, good old sword, and I target. Now right now I can still move left and right, but I would probably want to stay facing the opponent, which we've covered in the past how to do that, so you can imagine you'll be seeing that again soon. So we'll, staying, we'll stay here facing the opponent, and we'll be able to target this opponent directly. So if these AI are attacking me, and both of them are here, I may want to focus on this one first, so I want to target that one. That's where this comes in handy. Also, it's really useful if I have to do a certain action, like an assassination or a you know a specific thing, like I was going to pickpocket. Might be worth it to know exactly what object, what item I'm I'm targeting. That way, the player has that association with what's going to happen in the game. If they see that they're targeting the wrong player or the wrong character, wrong enemy, then things might change. They might not want to do that action to them. They might want to reset and then target this guy instead. So that's what we're going to be covering today. If you'd like to get caught up in the series, we are on episode 38 of the third person and action RPG tutorial series. So we still have a really long way to go, but I'm proud of where we've come so far, how far we've come. And if you'd like to get caught up, I'll link this playlist in the top right corner right here. You can check out everything we've done to get you to this point. Alternatively, I'll link you to this episode right here, which is where we went over some of the movement mechanics and zoom in mechanics that could be useful for today's episode like we can also zoom in nice and smooth like this to look freely at the world around us all right let's go ahead and get started so we're going to need two main files today and that is going to be our code class for our character and the blueprint class for our character as well let's start with the code and so i'm going to go into the code and i'm going to go to my third person tutorial character.h or basically my base character.h whatever your base character is we're going to have to add quite a few variables today as well as a function so starting with the function i added a new function called toggle lock on so it's void toggle lock on and what this does is this is going to be us manually pressing the button so we're going to press the lock on button, right? We have to set up a button that we can press and that's our lock on button. Once we press that button, we want to start the lock on functionality. If we press it again, we want to toggle it off. We want to stop the lock on functionality. So that's what this function is going to do. So we need a function for that so we can bind it to the input action that we're going to set up in the project settings. You'll notice I did not make it U function blueprint callable. You could if you want. You're more than welcome to. Uh, I definitely don't need to right now, so I did not do it. But by all means, feel free to. Now I scroll down to my variables, and I tend to keep all my variables organized by their type. So we're going to have one Boolean here. And that is going to be is locked on. And it's going to determine if the character is currently targeting or locked on to an object. So if we're in the locked on state, we can do certain things. Like we can change some animations. We might be able to only do certain actions when we're locked on. We might slow the walk speed, change the camera. There's a lot we can do. So it's important that we know if we're in this locked on state or not. Just like how we determined if we were sprinting or if we were zoomed in and these other types of actions that the character can do this one i did add a u property line to that makes it edit anywhere and blueprint read write because we will be viewing it in the blueprint editing it in the blueprint using it in the blueprint you know there's a lot we can do with it because depending on the the different type of item or enemy that we're locking on to we might change the logic as well like again it could be an objective in the world as opposed to an enemy 
So we'll have to spawn, you know, have some UI or HUD elements related to that so that the player knows they're locked on more so than just moving around. Maybe a little indicator, a little crosshairs, something like that. So we got this Boolean. Then I'm going to scroll down to my floats, and I'm going to add something called targeting height offset. Now this is a really small thing, but this is something I want to do because this gives us more freedom over where our camera is going to be when we're going into the target and lock on mode. That can be really important because for me, the standard targeting uh, height was a little too low. I didn't like where it was initially. So when I was targeting, it looked like the character was taking up most of the screen. I didn't really enjoy it. We're going to lerp in the future, just like our zoom says so how this is a nice like over the shoulder effect. Right now, the lock on is instant. So when we lock on, we immediately go here. And so if I don't like where it's positioned, I may want to raise it a little bit. So my character is not directly in the middle of the, the screen blocking the opponent that I'm locked on to that sort of behavior. So I added a little modifier, a little uh, offset for that. It's not required that you do this, but I think it will make your targeting and lock on a little bit nicer, especially if you have, if you do have multiple characters of different sizes. So you have a taller character or you allow the players to customize their own characters and they can change the height. Then the target might be a little bit weird for bigger characters or a little bit weird for smaller characters. So having this customizable isn't a bad idea anyway. I didn't make this a U property or anything because I'm just using this in the code today. So you can take note of that. Then there's two other things that I have added. So I've added a locked on actor and something called lock on candidates. So if we go over this, we're going to need the character that we're currently locked on to, but we also need to know all the candidates, uh, actors or other objects that we could lock on to. Right, so we have one that we're focusing, but you could have several within range that could be locked onto, and we need to know both of those things. So the locked on actor is the actor currently being tracked, locked onto by the character. We have the Boolean to know that we're locked on, but we still need to know the specific object as well, because if we have a specific object, then that changes, you know, where we're looking to see them. And again, it could change other behavior, such as just the crosshairs for the lock on, like the color of them, if it's an enemy or friendly, it could change a lot of different things. And we need to know exactly what actor this is that we are looking at. So I've made it an A actor pointer pointing to the actor. If you don't know what a pointer is, don't worry. It's not that important for now. We're going to get into a lot more of this as the series goes on. This is a good way to keep track of an actor without keeping an entire reference to it. So as these other actors get bigger, say the enemy might have a lot of logic in him. So instead of storing entire enemies worth of data in our third person tutorial character, we could just point to this object and grab the relevant data from there. Okay. And again, I made this U property. This is probably a good one to keep U property because we will be able to see the locked on actor when we're in the blueprint. So we're definitely going to want to do that. Now, lastly, I have the lock on candidates, which these are the actors within lock on range with the potential to be targeted enemies, objectives, etc. So yeah, this is essentially an array of actors that have the potential to be targeted, to be locked onto, right? Because we could have three enemies that are within the lock on range and we'll eventually be able to swap between them. So one, two, three, switch between the enemies. But right now we only, we're only focusing on targeting one, but we still need to know who we can lock on to. That way we can't just lock on to any actor in the world, right? They have to be either within a certain distance or of a certain type, stuff like that. Again, made it a U property, but I make it in a T array of a actor. So T array, just as Unreal's array. You've seen this before, probably. If you've been following the series, you've definitely seen it. And so this is just an array of actors. So we can keep track of all the actors that are within range and can be locked onto. All right, the rest of this is the same as it has been. So we're now going to go into our third person tutorial character.cpp. 
We're going to scroll down to our constructor where we set all of the default values for our variables, and I'm going to go ahead and set them all here. I don't set anything in the array or add any individual elements in the array because we don't know. We don't necessarily have uh, lock on candidates when the character is spawned. But we can default our other values. So is locked on is going to default to false. The targeting height offset, I know a value that I want to use, so I can use 20, but you could customize this per character, or you could leave it at zero for now and change it later. I know 20 is a good value through trial and error, so I pick 20. Locked on actor, I default to no pointer because we don't have an actor that we're currently locked on to. All right. Now we have to go and we have to bind the input action that we're setting up to target lock on going to that mode to a function, but we don't have that input action made yet. So we're going to go into the editor. We're going to click edit project settings. Then we want to scroll down here and select input. Scroll down in the input action section to action mappings and press plus to add another action mapping. I called mine target lock on. Whatever you want to call it is fine. I couldn't decide if I want to call it targeting or lock on, so I just kind of called it both. And then make sure you have a key assigned to it. So I have the three key. Three on my keyboard is assigned to it right now, but you can make anything you want. Just type it in there and select it. So when I press the three key on my keyboard, I want to call the function that's going to trigger the lock on. And that's what we're going to do. So going back into the code, now that we have that set up, we have to do the standard bind action logic that we do and set up player input component. Right now we're not using a player controller like we are in some of our other series, so this is all done in the character. But if you're doing it in the character, the player controller, it's really not very different. We're just going to call the function we wanted perform when that button is pressed. So in the character and in this function specifically, you can copy the logic of your other bindings, but we want to grab the player input component that is passed in to set up player input component. And we want to call the bind action function on it. Now the first parameter here is the name of the input action. So you pick the name that you just chose in the project settings. And I just closed it, but I called mine target lock on. So you can copy this or you can type it in again, but make sure this is the first parameter. All right, so target lock on. The next parameter is what type of input it is. So you have pressed or released are the main ones here. We're going to do pressed because when we press it, we want to toggle the lock on. Could be toggling it on or off, but either way, it's on a press. Next parameter is this because it's referring to this character class that we're performing the action on. And then the last parameter is the function you want to call. So you put the ampersand, the name of the class, colon, colon, the name of the function. Again, you could copy your other ones, but that is how this is set up. We want to call our new toggle lock on function. Now it's okay, you haven't set that up yet, so it might be red or underlined. We're going to go make that function now. So scroll down to wherever you want to make it. I put mine pretty much right at the bottom. I have toggle lock on here. So go ahead and write this out. Set up your function. Now the inside logic may look a little complicated. It's actually pretty simple, but it could be confusing. And so we want to know if we're already locked on or not, because remember, this is a toggle. So a toggle is on and off but not separate buttons. If it's off and I press it, it turns on. If it's on and I press it, it turns off. So that's why it's a toggle. Now our Boolean defaults to false, right? Is locked on is false. So the first time we press it, we're going to be locking on, assuming we have an actor that we can actually lock on to. It's within the range. It's the right type of actor. Then we're going to be locking on the first time we press it. If we're already locked on, we press it, then we're not going to be locking onto anything. We're going to be going back into the free mode. So if we are locked on, we're turning it off. That's the easy one. We just reset is locked on to be false and then disable the locked on actor. Just make it no pointer. Because we're resetting is locked on saying we're not locked on anymore. And then we're just removing the, the, the pointer 
setting it back to none so that we don't have an actor to actually focus on. It's very simple. Now the else is where we actually want to trigger the lock on. So this could be slightly confusing, slightly complicated. Right now it's pretty easy because we don't have swaps going on and we don't have that, that specific distance that's kicking us out. But there's still a little bit in here that we have to do to figure out who we can lock on to. So first of all, we need to know who's in the lock on candidates because right now no one's in this array. No actors are in the lock on candidates array, so we have nothing to lock on to. So we have to populate this. Now, you could go ahead and write the code now, but it's not going to make a lot of sense if you don't know where they're added from. So I'm going to go back into the editor, and I'm actually going to enter the blueprint class for my base character BP. So I load up base character BP, and I can go to my viewport. Now, everything in here has stayed the same except for one collision box that I've added. So you can click Add, search for Box Collision. And this is what I've added. You could also add something like a Sphere Collision or a Capsule Collision. There's actually already the Capsule, com uh, capsule Collision component on the character, so you won't want to do that. But you have the Sphere Collision right here. You could also use the Box Collision, I think, works well for now because... Uh, we do want to add, you know, we want to be able to target enemies above, below, at our sides, wherever. You can choose the range. But I've added a box collision. Uh, when you add it, you can just be on the base character BP self here. You don't have to be on an individual component. If you do, it might kind of throw some things off because it could place it in the wrong spot. It could place it as a child of another object. So I'd recommend doing it right from the top in the hierarchy. It'll just be called box. If you don't have another box collision here, it'll literally just be called box. You can rename it. I called it target collision box instead. Right click, rename if you want to change it. Now, most of the, the settings in this box collision can stay the same. So I changed it from, these were all scales of one. So is this tiny? Well, how's that gonna help me? Who am I gonna lock onto with that, right? So from here, I just changed the scales to values that I liked. So I said 15 this way seems pretty good. You could potentially do something like this instead. That way they have to be in front of you to lock on to them, not just anywhere around you. However, because we're not facing the, the character toward the enemy at all times while we're targeting, you may not want to do that just yet. Regardless, you can pick a size. I picked 15, 15, because I thought that was a pretty good range to lock on to opponents from and 10 to give them a little bit of height as well. Because you notice while I was on the stairs, I could lock on to the enemies below me, right? So if I'm here, I can actually lock on to these enemies. Perfect, so we have this collision box. Now, I'm gonna scroll down and go to my collision settings as well. So under collision, you have collision presets, and this is gonna default to overlap all dynamic or overlap all, could depend on the version of Unreal that you have. Now, I made mine custom because right now I only want to care about the characters. I will be including caring about, again, vehicles, friendlies potentially, and other objects and objectives. However, right now, if you leave everything on overlap all, and we can do that, we have some overlap events that are going to pick up all the, the cubes in our world because of the way they were handled. Now, don't worry, we will update and fix that, but... We don't have to do that right now. We don't have to worry about all that right now. That is just because everything is overlap all. There's a good chance that we don't have to include all these anyway. We may want to overlap pawns and like maybe one other world, static world dynamic, or we could just make a different collision preset entirely, a collision channel entirely, and then we wouldn't have to worry about that. So we'll, we'll fix that. We'll make it so you don't have to just use pawns. However, for now, I'd recommend just changing it to custom, selecting ignore all, but then allowing pawn to be overlap. That way we can still overlap with our enemies, but nothing else. Lastly, on the collision box, you can scroll down to the events and add the on component begin overlap and on component end overlap. You click the little plus and it will make the events in the graph for you. So you have these two nodes after you've clicked plus on both. 
And once you make the begin overlap, by the way, you will have to go and click on the collision box again and get the end overlap. Okay, so once you have both of these in here, we can fill out the logic that we want to happen. The logic we want to happen is very simple. We just want to add the possible actors to the candidate list. Okay, so yes, we allowed only pawns to be added to the, the character list. So you could add them directly to the lock on candidates. I'm casting to the default enemy for now, just to show you, you can do this. If you don't want something like friendlies included and you just want enemies, then you can cast to your default enemy. However, it's actually not that complicated. Like I said, you could, if you don't care and you want to be able to target anything, friends and enemies, then you could delete the cast entirely. We're only allowing pawns right now to be overlapped with, and you could just do this logic. Okay, so either method is fine. Those are both, they're both the same method either way. It's just if you want to filter the different classes that you can lock onto. We'll do more of this when we go over swapping, so don't worry about it too much. Here's what we need to do though. We definitely need to grab our lock on candidates array. This is the one we made in code. Now we want to add or add unique the component we overlapped with, the actor we overlapped with. Now, you could do regular add. The problem is if you get the same actor in here and add it to the array and it does not get removed from the array properly, which could happen for a few reasons, could happen due to collision changes, uh, like the presets change and they now ignore the overlap, could happen because they teleport out, so even though they don't really, they end the overlap, it could actually skip the end overlap event because they didn't just walk out of it. So add is a little risky. It's easier to just add unique. You could get it to work with add, but it's like, why do it, right? If we could have add unique, and this will make sure if the element is already in this array, we don't add it again. This doesn't mean you couldn't have multiple of the same actor type, so we can have two of the enemy, base enemy BPs, but we just can't have two of the exact same. We can't add the same enemy twice, but we could have two pumpkin golems, for example. Okay, so just add unique and pass in other actor. The actor that we begin overlapping with is the actor we want to add. They are now within the range that we've provided to be able to lock onto them. End overlap is essentially the same, except once they leave that range to be able to lock onto them, they are no longer a lock-on candidate. So we get lock-on candidate one more time. Okay, and then we remove. And I chose remove item, not index, but remove the item. And I just pass the other actor directly into it. So if it finds that actor in there, it will remove it. I recommend leaving the other actor as a cast for now. Simply because if you do not do this, then you can pick up on other actors in your world if you have them for any reason. Now I use this tutorial series for a few things. I use it for some of the one-off episodes I do as well. And so I may add things from time to time that I might lock on to if I do this. And it could make things a little confusing. So I'm going to leave it for now. We can go ahead and go back into the code and figure out what happens when we try to initiate a lock on. So this is where we left off. So we were in the else and toggle lock on. And this is if we're trying to lock on to somebody. So now we have to know who we can lock on to. So within the else, I have if lock on candidates dot num is greater than zero. Dot num returns the actual number of elements in the array, not an index. So if there are zero, if lock on candidates dot num returns zero, there are no elements in the array. There is no one to lock on to. We want to skip all this logic. We don't want to do anything. If it's greater than zero, there's at least one candidate we can lock on to. So with that said, right now we don't have swapping enabled. It's actually pretty simple to set up, just not covering it today. So we want to set our locked on actor to the default value. And for me, that is index zero of lock on candidates because all we're checking to see if it, if it is greater than, if there is greater than zero candidates available. 
So we know there's at least one, which would be index zero of the lock on candidates array. So we can set our locked on actor to lock on candidates zero, defaulted to that. Then if there is a locked on actor after this, okay, after this actually goes through, we want to set is locked on to true. Now you could skip this extra if check because this is almost definitely going to be valid. However, in case anything goes wrong with lock on candidates here and locked on actor here, then locked on actor could be false and is locked on would be true. And then it would try to lock on and you wouldn't be able to. Now it would have to happen on a different thread at this specific time, but it doesn't really hurt to check. So feel free to do this check or leave it out if you want. You probably won't see any issues with it, but I was just being on the safe side, making sure that this was a valid actor. This did get assigned to something other than no pointer. And once it does, we can say that we are officially locked on. Now I'm going to scroll down to my tick function, which is right below it. We already had a lot in here, like calling a blueprint tick, determining our sprinting logic and determining our zoomed in logic. But I've now added another if statement in here, which is our locked on logic. So this is where we're actually going to use the follow logic so we can stay locked on to the object, the actor that we're targeting. However, this will also be where we make the nice smooth transition for the lock on and when we eventually disable the lock on. So tick is a great place to do this. And all we really want to do is if we are locked on, we want to do this logic. There's no else because if we're not locked on, we just want to go back to our default logic that already exists in the character. We're just not going to do this stuff and it's just going to work plain and simple. All right. So to get this working, we need to determine where we need to look. So we need to look at the actor that we're locked on to, right? It's pretty simple in theory. How do we actually do that? Well, there's actually a lot of math involved, but uh, Unreal is very kind and Kismet Math Library is really kind and it has something called find look at rotation. So it does a lot of the math for you and it will determine where we have to look to get the result that we want, what rotation this object has to be at to get the result we want. So we're going to make a variable that's an F rotator and I call it look at rotation. And then we're going to set it equal to this line. However, you won't be able to use UKismet math library because we have to include it. It's not included by default. So if you scroll up to the top of the file, add this include, you can add it to the very bottom. Pound include kismet slash kismet math library dot H. All right, once you have that, you can go back to this logic here and then we're going to use ukismet math library colon colon. Okay, this is a static class. So we use the class colon colon to grab a function and we're going to find look at rotation. Okay, find look at rotation takes in two parameters. It takes in a start and an end or a start and a destination. We're starting wherever our actor is located. Okay. And we're ending wherever the locked on actor is located. So we pass in get actor location and then locked on actor get actor location. Very simple in theory, right? We're just taking where we are and then we're trying to figure out the look at rotation for where the locked on actor is. Now that actually gets us the proper look at rotation. But what I'm going to do next is going to improve the, the camera visibility and the targeting visibility a little bit in my honest opinion. So we're going to use our targeting height offset that we set up. That's that float we set up in the .h file. And we're going to change the pitch because I always find it's a little too low. No matter how many times I do this, I always find it's a little lower than I want. If you like it without, again, perfectly fine. But I always feel it's a little low. So I take my look at rotation dot pitch. I do minus equal and then I take my targeting height offset and that raises it a little bit. But regardless, if you do this line or not, we just need to use our look at rotation and set the control rotation of the controller. 
We're not technically done with this, but it's good enough for today's episode. You're going to see when we do some of the smoothing that we can change this a little bit to make it a little bit nicer, a little bit easier to make the player know that they are locked on to the enemy or to any object. Okay, so we grab get controller, then we call it set control rotation, then we pass in look at rotation. All right, now once you do that, you can come into the editor and you can press your button that you set up in the project settings and you should lock onto your opponent. As I said, we never disengage the lock, even when we remove the lock on candidates when they leave the, the bounds of the box collider. That is intentional for now. So we can go around and we can always stay locked onto them, but we can also manually engage and disengage. So if I press it again, I've disengaged it and now I can walk and it does not follow the pumpkin golem, but also I can look around freely. You'll notice that when I lock on, I cannot look around freely. It is just forced to look at the enemy here. All right, guys, but that's all I got for you. So thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed it and I helped you learn about how to lock on to different enemies and objects in your world, then please subscribe. It does more for myself and the channel than anything else you can do, and I just really appreciate it. I want to give a huge shout out to my YouTube membership and Patreon supporters and subscribers. Thank you all for everything that you do and for continuing to show me that awesome and excellent support. I really appreciate it. I'm really grateful. This series is so incredibly enjoyable to work on, and I'm glad you guys are enjoying it as well. If you had any issues with this tutorial or any of my tutorials, feel free to join the Discord community. I'd be happy to assist you. It's completely free. Like I said, that's all I got. So thank you so much for watching. I'm Sean the Bro, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye, guys.